Well, Ken Ramirez, could you please uh, tell me what your present title is? Uh, yes, I'm the Assistant Curator for Marine Mammals and Supervisor of Marine Mammal Training for the John G. Shedd Aquarium. Okay. How long have you had that title? I have been with the aquarium since the end of 1988, so it's been about four and a half years now. I've uh, mm -hmm. been here since the inception of our new oceanarium. I see. Uh -huh. And did you came in as the... Uh, as with that title? And yes, yes, I was okay. I was hired here to mm -hmm. put together the animal care programs. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other present uh, affiliation, professional affiliations? or? I am currently on the board of directors for the International Marine Animal Trainers Association, okay. past president of that. I'm on the scientific advisory board for the uh, Texas Marine Mammal Stranding Network and uh, currently that's that's mm -hmm. those are my affiliations. Uh, prior to coming to the Shed Aquarium, uh, where w were you? Prior to this, I was uh, a curator of marine mammals for uh, Marine World of Texas on Galveston Island, and I was there for six years. And prior to that, I was with Ocean Safari on South Padre Island, where I was supervisor of training. And uh, prior to that, I was at the Aquarium of Mexico City, where I was uh, oh. training coordinator for three years. And prior to that, I was at Marine World of Texas, where I started where I was just uh, an entry-level trainer at the time and, and worked right. there for three years. Well, start working back, you've mentioned uh, times here, and uh, I can place the days. When when did you start with that first position there at uh, uh, Marine World? My first position as a marine mammal trainer was in February of 1977. Mm -hmm. And that was at? That was at Marine World, World of Texas. Texas. Okay. Uh, before you became a marine animal trainer, were you in any other kind of work? Yes. Uh, when I became a marine animal trainer, I was in college. Uh, and when I went to college, I was going to school because I had uh, been working at uh, the Institute for the Blind, where we trained guide dogs for the blind. And I was an entry-level position. I actually started as a volunteer and became a groomer mm -hmm. and then a handler and really got fascinated with the idea of, of dog training and uh, training guide dogs for the blind. And so when I went to school, that's what I thought. I was going to go to school for, and somehow it led me into dolphin training. I see. Well, that's a good start, yeah. I would think. Yeah, right. right. Uh, well, going back a little bit farther now, uh, where did you grow up? I grew up in a lot of different places. My, uh, when I was born, my father was in the Army, so I traveled around a bit. Mm -hmm. And then both my parents are PhDs, and as they alternately worked on their masters and their PhDs, they went to different schools <laughs> okay. to do that, so we would travel to different locations. Uh, <laughs> I grew up a large part of my young life in Texas, uh, but then I also lived in Indiana and then moved back to Texas again. And then, uh, uh, so I guess most of my growing up was done in, the, in both Texas, Indiana, and Texas. That's yeah. probably would be what I'd say. I, I consider myself a Texan. <laughs> okay. Yes, I do. Uh, well, uh, in all of this growing up, where did you finally wind up in high school? Where did you graduate from high school? I graduated from high school in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. But because of the moving around, I went to three different high schools <laughs> in four years. <laughs> all right. When did you get your high school degree? When did you graduate? I graduated in 1975. And uh, when did you go to college? I when started I started in, uh, in the fall of 75 uh, and got an associate's degree at San Antonio College and then uh, went for a semester to NYU, and then went for a, uh, uh, a semester to UCLA, and then I finished up at the University of Houston, and I spent four years at the University of Houston. I see. And what uh, degree did you wind up with? Bachelor's degree in biology. Is that a BS? Yes. Yes, all right. And what was the date of that degree then? That would have been in, that was while I was, would have been 19, I want to say it was 1981. I, I think it was 1981. That's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, what uh, hobbies and uh, avocations, interests did you have when you were in school, in grade school and high school, would you say? Oh, uh, when I was in uh, uh, grade school and high school, I was very active in uh, in sports. I was pr particularly active in cross country running. Uh, I also uh, have always been a very avid movie buff and always enjoyed that, and uh, was active in theater quite a bit. And what else? What other interesting things have I? I probably tried a little bit of everything uh, in my uh, when I was a kid. I I didn't uh, shy away from trying a lot of different things, but uh, those are probably the ones that stick out most in my mind right now. Did you have any animals when you were young? Yes, growing up, well, two in two ways. I uh, growing up, we always had a dog. I had a dog at different at different times of my uh, youth, and. Uh, my mom came from a ranching family, and so I spent a lot of time in the summers growing up on a ranch 
Uh, it was probably my first exposure to training without realizing it. As a kid, uh, my grandfather and uncle uh, had uh, cattle dogs that helped mm -hmm. herd the cattle, and they were very well-trained dogs. And uh, I, at the time, was not aware of how well-trained they were, but, uh, and so I grew up around animals at that point. Uh, what would you say your ambitions were in your childhood days, uh, let's say prior to college anyway? What, what did you want to be? Did you have any uh, goals? Prior to high school, I think I probably thought I was going to be an actor or something of mm -hmm. that nature. Um, but it was, in co it was in high school that I began volunteering at the Institute for the Blind. So it was in high school that I began thinking that I was going to go into some kind of animal training or dog training mm -hmm. at the very least. Um, I, I think that's, but as a kid, I, I'm sure I went through a lot of those phases of wanting to be a fireman and a policeman and everything else. But uh, as I started realistically thinking about it, as I started going toward high school, I thought I was interested in getting to some kind of performing uh, okay. kind of uh, uh, kind of area, and then I, I started gravitating more toward the animal field. Um, what people may have influenced you in your early career interests there, early college days or late high school, say? I, I would say certainly the, the biggest influence for me for getting into this field was my days working at the Institute for the Blind. Uh, um, I worked with a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Don Baylor. He was uh, one of the lead trainers at the Institute for the Blind. He was somebody who really took me under his wing and, and really encouraged me to, to get involved, and that was my first real interest in thinking to, that I'd like to get into, get involved in working with animals and, and caring for animals. Uh, and then throughout the throughout my career in this field, the last 16 years, there's been a lot of different people who've probably influenced me quite a bit. Now, uh, did you take any other uh, college work after you graduated from no. Hughes University? No, no I, once I finished uh, school, I've been working full-time in the field and have not returned back to uh -huh. school at all. Well, you certainly have plenty to do. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, you, did you see any military service? No. Okay. And um, it, when you were in college, any of the colleges or even high school, did you study any behavioral psychology? Actually, I had a number of psychology courses. Uh, I, I was told by uh, the people that I worked with with the uh, dogs that it would be really important to get a, a strong background in psychology. So during the first two years of college I, I had a lot of psychology degrees, psychology courses thinking that I was going to go toward a, a degree in either applied psychology or psychology and then once I got the job, I was still in college when I got the job at Marine World of Texas and then I switched my, de my degree to just uh, uh, a, a general biology degree. Mm -hmm. uh, in these courses did the school teach much about Skinner? Yes. Uh, I, I, it's hard to look back and say much about it, but mm -hmm. I certainly, there were certainly several, uh, several texts that we had to read that uh, would refer to B.F. Skinner a lot, that would mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk about Skinnerian theory and look at the different, uh, some of the different studies and things that he had done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Aside from the gentleman at the, uh, uh, at uh, uh, Don Baylor, I believe you said mm -hmm. his name was, right. at the Institute for the Blind, uh, were there any particular people who led you into your present career in marine mammals and individuals? Um, well? there, there, there certainly were. Um, it's it's kind of hard to pinpoint who it would have been or who I may have learned the most from. I, I, I traveled around quite a bit. Uh, one of, uh, uh, there were a lot of different people that I worked with and I, I really don't, can't think of any one individual that uh, uh, that really geared me in this direction. I, I moved around a lot and worked with a lot of different people and I know that it's the many different people that I worked with that certainly shaped me and influenced me and got me reading more things and, and uh, got me really interested in the field. I think it was my involvement with uh, the International Marine Animal Trainers Association and the contacts I made there that really made me think of this as a profession. When I first started in the field in uh, February of 1977, it was really still just a job to do while I was going to school. Uh, and it wasn't until I had been in the field for three years working full time and become involved in IMATA that I began, began to know people in the field like uh, Randy Brill or Karen Pryor or some of these people who, who really made me see that there was a lot of really unique directions and neat things that we could do in this field and that there really was a future here if we applied ourselves properly. And so. Uh, those are names that stick out in my head, but they aren't people that I really necessarily worked with. They're people who influenced me, though, through organizations like IMATA. Uh, when you started in your marine mammal uh, career, did you have any particular goal in mind? What did you hope to accomplish at this point? Um, when I first started, it really was simply
Mm. Which I thought was going to be very vital and very important to working with the, the guide dogs in the future. And uh, it was a couple years doing that that made me realize that I wanted to stay in this field. And I didn't have any de de definitive ambitions at the time other than I wanted to learn as much as I could about marine mammals and learn as much about training them and caring for them as I could. And uh, I didn't necessarily have a, a specific goal that I was aiming for at the time. I think I, I always took it a day at a time. It, it wasn't until I'd been in the field for probably six or seven years that I began realizing that I needed to make some decisions about where my life was going and realized that I wanted to stay in an administrative role and particularly be involved in designing animal care programs and, and teaching. One of the things I really am very interested in is teaching young trainers how to train and teaching people how to work with animals. Uh, what um, uh, particular event or person do you recall first led you to use uh, the methods you use here, operant conditioning? or in I'll tell you, it was quite honestly a combination of, of, of things. Um, I, I'm going to avoid using names in certain cases only because I worked in some facilities and with some people whose methods and manners of training that I, I didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. But I certainly learned a lot from that. I think you learn a lot from seeing things that you don't quite like the way they, they handle an animal or treat an animal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, certainly the basics of training I learned from, uh, from working with Don Baylor and his people at uh, the Institute for the Blind. As I started working with marine mammals, uh, I began really getting to see a variety of different techniques. But even the, the, the people who had what I considered bad technique all took a very similar approach to training. And um, uh, I really feel that my training style, and I am responsible for the training program that we have here at the aquarium, has been a derivative of all these different mm -hmm. people that I've met and different people that I've worked with. Um, I know that, uh, uh, as an example, one of the texts that I use, which is not really a textbook, but one of the books that I use for our staff is Karen Pryor's book, Don't Shoot the Dog. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a wonderful book for anybody coming into the field, whether if they don't come to it with a psychology background, they, it's written in a very non-technical format that people can really kind of understand and begin to see how different things affect behavior. Um, and uh, I really feel like Karen's work was, was a real influence. Uh, I look at uh, uh, one of the books that we use, uh, that I use a lot is, uh, it's a, you were a co-author, I believe, Animal Behavior. Um, it's a book, a uh, pinkish colored book. Uh, I, I, okay, paperback. It's, it's a paperback yeah, book. Yeah, okay. That, uh, well, that's uh, interesting. And uh, <laughs> we use that book. And then there's a couple of others that, uh, that I like to use to, to guide people toward uh, um, um, learning as much as they can about different techniques of training. Um, but I'm, I'm floundering at trying to find a specific sure. person oh, that, to, okay. to, put, to put a name on. Well, uh, what do you call your methods of training animals here? Do you have any particular name you get, give to your methods? No, we, 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 we refer to what we do as uh, using operant conditioning. Uh, uh, I like to talk to people when people tell me about, ask me about training. Um, I teach our staff that there's a one word definition for training and the w definition that I like to use for training is simply teaching. That's all training is. Uh, we are teaching our animals how to live in this new environment we've created for it. And uh, we, of course, use the basic techniques of operant conditioning, positive reinforcement. You, you want to reinforce positively good behavior and ignore bad behavior. And uh, we utilize those pretty, pretty basic principles when, going about, uh, when we go about training. And then I like to divide training into um, uh, primary and secondary reasons for training. We have the primary reasons, which for me are are those things which directly benefit the animal that you are caring for, such as giving it mental stimulation, physical exercise, cooperative behaviors like the husbandry behaviors. And then there's the secondary reasons for training. Secondary reasons for training training are education, research, but there, there are things that may benefit our knowledge or our understanding of the species or conservation, but they don't necessarily benefit the individual animal. And, uh, and that's sort of the philosophy that we take as we try to put the primary reasons for training first and, and approach training in that, in that way. How would you uh, describe your methods as being different from the old-fashioned traditional animal training methods? You know, it's interesting because I, I think that some of the old-fashioned traditional methods of animal training, I, I learned from what I would consider some of the old-fashioned traditional uh, people who worked with the animals in, in that way. And I think 
when you really strip it away animal training is animal training and a good animal trainer whether they're they're very loving in their way of dealing with animals or very harsh in their dealing with the animals if they're good animal trainers they tend to still use basic techniques of of positively reinforcing good behavior using a lot of the basic operant conditioning techniques um, using a lot of those kinds of skills uh, when I look back at my at my uncle and grandfather who trained guide dogs after having studied animal behavior and trained for many many years I go back and watch what they did and I was thinking to myself well they're doing all the things that I have learned to do yet they didn't realize they didn't have the technical terms for it but they certainly were still doing it when you see people training animals I think there aren't that many differences what I see is the difference not is so much as is how we train but in the way we apply it I think where I see a difference in the old style of training and the new style of training is that the old style of training was we've got to train our animals to get a show done and by God I'm in charge that animal is going to do what I tell it to do and all of our attention was focused on getting the animal to perform its specific behavior on cue on time in a show today where I see the difference is the techniques we use for training are very similar but our emphasis is different here at the Shedd Aquarium for example and we're not unique in this our presentations are, are, are not the central part of our exhibit. We do a public presentation where we have the animals uh, exhibiting behaviors on cue, but we're not as concerned as to whether the animals are as sharp and, and do their porpoising behavior in exactly this location, exactly at this time, and, and we're not as concerned about that as we are about trying to enhance the animal's environment. One of our first priorities is teaching the animals to cooperate in the medical behaviors, the husbandry behaviors, and those were things that when I began training, nobody did. At least nobody that I knew of taught their animals to give blood voluntarily or <laughs> taught their animals to give a stomach sample or submit to ultrasound. We just lowered the water, jumped in the pool, caught the animal, dragged them out of the water, and, and did the exam. Uh, today, I don't think there's very many institutions in the United States, at least, that don't do the husbandry behaviors and the medical behaviors. So I think if I were to analyze the techniques for training, Really, if you strip away the facade, the basic techniques are the same, um, with some differences. And certain there's certain philosophies and theories that I think that each of us have that may be a little different from each other. But overall, the basic principles of training I find are the same. It's the way we apply them now and how we use them that, to me, are very different. What about the uh, you might say the more traditional animal trainers' use of uh, avoidance? conditioning uh, there's not much of that left in dolphin training no there's I not think, as a matter of fact uh, 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 when I first began there was a lot of that in use with uh, with sea lions mm -hmm. and uh, a little bit with uh, with uh, with dolphins and for example uh, I was taught that the way you teach a dolphin to move from one pool to another is you use a net you use a net you move the animal and the animal gets used to it and you finally put it on cue and the animal gates because he's afraid the net's going to be put in if you don't if he doesn't none of our animals here were trained using a net we were actually we taught them to do a basic a to b behavior they would go from point a to point b get reinforced to point b pretty soon we put a to b through a door and then over a distance and they got a, a hand signal which means move from this pool to that pool um, and it worked very well very simple and the animal went to the other pool because he wanted to go not because he was forced to go and you're right uh, and and i have worked around in some of the facilities that i worked at I worked with a number of land animal uh, trainers um, at one of the facilities where I was training coordinators. <coughs> I had, had very little experience in training primates or big cats, but there were primates and big cats there. And one of the things I really noticed with the big cats is that there was a lot of animals uh, remained at their seat or at their station uh, because the trainer used, you know, used harsh words or would crack his whip, and and that's what. It, it was almost it was almost training by intimidation. The animal realized, and when an animal got out of line, the uh, the trainer would take out his whip and, and hit the animal and crack the animal. And I don't think the, that he was truly causing any real injury to the animal at all, but he certainly was was training by using a lot of avoidance techniques. And you're right, uh, I I I think of where we where we use avoidance techniques in, in dolphin training today, and and it, I'm hard pressed to think of any uh, any real examples of it anymore. And I think it really has phased out. I think it's phased out for a number of reasons. I think it's really nice for us to look at ourselves and say, well, we've, we've really grown and we understand the difference, and I think we do, but we also have a lot of pressures facing us today. We have a lot of protest groups that are looking at us. We have a number of government agencies looking at us all the time, and with all this constant pressure, 
we in some ways were forced to re-examine our techniques and our ways of doing things and that forced us to progress and I think in a very positive and good direction. I also think that uh, when we look at our program here at the Shedd Aquarium, if you were to ask the public which animals do they train, everybody would assume we train our dolphins and our whales because they're a part of our public pres presentations. We also train our otters and our penguins and our harbor seals. Why? Because to us, training is such a critical and essential part of good animal care. You didn't used to worry about training a penguin because you could always pick it up and force it in the cage and do what you needed to do with it. While with killer whales, I think killer whales were one of the things that forced the marine mammal industry into thinking, we've got to teach these animals to help us get blood. <laughs> we've got to teach these animals to help us do this. Um, but now we apply it to dolphins, and we apply it to harbor seals, and we apply it to otters, and we find that we can apply it to all of the animals under our care. And then it means that that trust that you build with the animal remains because you're able to get the animal to voluntarily cooperate. And so I think the, the direction we've moved has been a positive direction, partly by, because we were forced to, partly because we got smarter, partly because we finally have managed to work together really well. Uh, I, I remember even, I'm, I'm a novice in this field, but I've been in the field 16 years, and as, as a youngster as I am, I can remember back 16 years ago when if you wanted to go talk to a, to a trainer at another facility, it was like, well, we can't tell you that. We're not allowed to talk about how we train that. And I, was, I didn't understand why. Um, today, there's really a very, very open line of communication. You can call almost any facility anywhere and say, I noticed you guys really have a, a lot of good luck getting your dolphins to give urine samples. How do you go about doing that? What techniques did you use? Uh, did you find any, where did you make mistakes? And people are willing to talk about those things. And so we all benefit from that and all of us are able to give better animal care because of it. Great. Uh, you mentioned uh, two books that uh, particularly that uh, you had read, uh, Karen Pryor's Don't Shoot the Dog and I guess my, uh, our own animal behavior. Right. right. Are there any other books or articles you can think of that uh, were influential in your in uh, in work? my in, in in my work? Yes, uh, a couple of others. There's a a, a book called uh, Animal Intelligence by Donald uh, Griffin. Griffin. Uh, Griffin, I think. Yeah, and uh, another one called uh, uh, well, that was one of the books, and then another couple of things that have really been, I think, were really helpful to me. Or just in learning about this industry, we're reading books like uh, Ken Norris's book, uh, Porpoise Watcher, Karen Pryor's book, Lads Before the Wind, and uh, Forrest Wood's book uh, on the Navy's uh, dolphin uh, program. Those three books, because, although they weren't technical books, were interesting because they talked about the beginning of, of this line of work in, in marine, in, with marine mammals. And it was fascinating to me to, to see where we came from. And, and the anecdotal stories that were there, those were really influential to me in, in, in getting a really broad history. And another thing that was really helpful to me was the, the, the International Marine Animal Trainers Association conference proceedings. I would, from the very first conference uh, that was assembled uh, back in 1971 with a handful of people as they sat there and 15 uh, trainers sat and talked about training techniques, and looking through those transcripts and reading through those kinds of things and seeing the the kinds of discussions that trainers had and, and were all very influential and are, are things that are part of our library here that I insist all of our trainers read and, and become familiar with so that they have some sense of where we've come from and some sense that some of the animal problems that we face today, the, the training problems that we face, you can look 20 years ago and see they had those problems too and here's how they solved them and a lot of the techniques and, and discussion that went on 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago is still relevant today. Uh, Pry, I know you didn't read all of these things at once, but could, could you give me a time frame in the, during which you were reading these books? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, uh, I can give you some kind of time frame. I, I, I know it was back in uh, the late 70s that I was first exposed to uh, the proceedings from the International Marine Animal Trainers Association, and that got me to realize that there was a world out there that I didn't, didn't know about. And then the next book I read that uh, was, again, probably prior to 1980 still was... Uh, Ken Norris's uh, The Porpoise Watcher, and I thought this was fascinating. And then uh, almost right in a row, I told somebody that I really liked that book, and they recommended Lads Before the Wind, and then right after that, Forrest Wood's book on the Navy's dolphin program, and that was in the early 80s. Um, I didn't really ever get hold of Karen Pryor's book, Don't Shoot the Dog. I, it's probably a newer book is why, but I didn't see that one until um, 
I came back from Mexico, and when I came back from Mexico, I was exposed to that book, and I also got the Animal Behavior book, uh, and so that was that was more like 1983 and 84, and it was about that time upon returning from Mexico that I became very active, active myself in IMATA. Prior to that, I was just a member who got all my stuff, and since the, about the mid 80s, I become active as a, a officer or a board member, a committee member, and have encouraged uh, people on my staff to become involved, and so then I had the resources of all these people at other facilities right at my fingertips and I started plugging into that network as well. Um, how many species of animals have you worked with? Um, goodness gracious, um, that's a good question. <laughs> I have worked extensively, besides, with, besides, let's just talk about marine mammals first. All with right. marine mammals, I have, because of my involvement with the stranding network, I've worked around a lot because we have a lot of mm -hmm. stranded animals, but that I haven't really tried to train, for example. I've, I've worked with uh, spotted dolphins and striped dolphins and minke whales and uh, rough-toothed dolphins, all of live strandings that we would nurse back to health. Um, if you count those, uh, there's been a lot. But if, you, if we want to talk just from a strictly behavioral standpoint, from a training standpoint, uh, my training with marine mammals has been bottlenose dolphins, beluga whales, Pacific white-sided dolphins, um, Pilot whales, killer whales, um, uh, one rough-toothed dolphin, um, and uh, w harbor porpoise, and then uh, pinniped, harbor seal, um, sea lion, and, ca and, and South American sea lion. So I, I'd say there's been ten marine mammal species. Uh, then also the sea otter, eleven, mm -hmm. and. Um, Bird-wise, I've dealt with a lot of birds. I, I've trained citizens quite extensively, as well as a number of raptors, although I don't really consider myself uh, very versed on raptor training, but, but the macaws and the cockatoos, uh, the, the citizens, I've done a lot of training with them. And then I've also trained uh, dogs, and, uh, and I've worked around horses. So all in all, total number of species would probably be 11 marine mammal species, probably uh, 20 to 25 bird species and uh, three or four other miscellaneous mammal mm -hmm. species. A bunch, in other words. <laughs> a bunch. I didn't know you wanted to be technical. A bunch, oh, that's yes. A, that's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, would you describe some of the, I know there, uh, you, there's a multitude of behaviors involved with these, but could you describe some of the particular ones you've been worked with that you've trained yourself? But, sure. Uh, okay. Um, uh, let me start with what I consider the more important behaviors. Um, in fact, what I'll do is sort of go over a list of the way I like to start training. And to me, some of the most important behaviors to train are not the spectacular ones, but simple things like gating. When I work in a facility like the Shedd Aquarium, we have these huge, this enormous pool, and, but we move animals from place to place. And to me, one of the most important behaviors we needed to train was simply teaching an animal on a simple hand cue to go from point A to point B into another pool. So gating is an important behavior that I emphasize with all animals before going anywhere is simply teaching them good stationing and gating. Um, probably one of the most exciting things for me is when I, about 10 years ago, when I started learning about husbandry behaviors, is beginning to train dolphins to give us their tails so we could get blood. And quite honestly, it was a difficult process because uh, it was new for me at the time, and it was well over a year and a half before we actually were able to get a voluntary blood sample for me on a dolphin. And well, now all with the exception of our two new belugas, which we just acquired here at the Shedd Aquarium, all of our dolphins and whales here give voluntary blood samples. And uh, to me, that was a big accomplishment. Uh, teaching uh, animals to accept a stomach tube or to submit to ultrasound, those were fun, fun behaviors and, and a quite an accomplishment. Um, other things that, we've, that, that I've been a part of training is I did a lot of extensive work with sea lions and uh, desensitizing sea lions to work among the public. To me that was fun and very exciting, getting an animal to be able to be comfortable walking among strangers and not worrying about getting them bit <laughs> or being comfortable with them being out in those kind of areas. That was fun for me. I uh, did some, uh, a couple commercial work for a, uh, a, um, a uh, Water Country USA, which is a, a water park, a, a summer water park, and they wanted one of their, their um, uh, mascots was a sea lion and they wanted a live sea lion sliding down their slides and playing in their wave machine and, and that was a challenge because we had a short time to do it in and I was in, I really enjoyed that. Um, other things, uh, water work with cetaceans was a lot of fun for me. Here at the Shedd Aquarium our focus is education and our administration is really not, does not approve of us 
getting in the water with the animals in front of the public. We do for, for our own fun and for stimulation for the animals, but in our presentations we geared toward natural behaviors and so we don't do as much of that and, you know, I, and I missed that I I did it was fun to get in there and do the rocket rides with the dolphins propelling you into the air and I've trained that and and doing those kinds of behaviors and those were always very enjoyable um, probably another real exciting time for me was I'd worked with uh, uh, bird shows a lot and done a lot of the the you know a bird playing poker or a bird uh, uh, doing something playing basketball or or doing an, a, a, a quote-unquote intelligence game. And those were fun behaviors, but it wasn't until one time I was asked to train a free flight behavior, which to me was like, <gasps> all the birds I had first worked with had all been either clipped or had had a couple of their, their primary feathers so that they would, wouldn't get flight. And, I, and when I got to Mexico City, I was put in charge of a bird program that had over 100 birds, and they wanted a free flight. Well, Fortunately, their stadium was such that the bird couldn't get away, but it was still kind of a scary thought. Uh, but it was really fun, and it was a challenge, and I really enjoyed that. And so that's another uh, type of behavior that I really worked a lot with. Um, one of the things that uh, I've done here at the Shedd Aquarium, when I first was learned how to train, I learned from a man who, who didn't believe in using a target. He didn't target train anything. He sat back in his chair and just shaped behavior by watching an animal move. And... I tr learned to train that way. I, I thought that was how training was done. I didn't know when I when somebody first introduced me to a target, it was like someone had invented the wheel. I thought this is great. <laughs> you can guide an animal through a behavior. Well, after that, all I did was use everything to train targets: backflips and jumps and spins and all these kind of really wonderful aerials that dolphins do. I target trained until I came across the Pacific white-sided dolphin. Pacific white-sided dolphins are naturally very acrobatic. They're very aerial. They jump, they spin, they flip. They do all sorts of wonderful things. And I remembered back to how I first learned to train and all of the dolphins' behaviors that we have here when I started the program here had all these brand new lags who had just been acquired from Monterey Bay in California, out in the ocean. And they were jumping and flipping and spinning all the time. And I said, I want to try something different. I don't want to target train a single aerial with the lags. I'd like to see us just shape their behavior. They're doing it naturally. Let's capture the behavior, shape it, and get it. And uh, that was a program we instituted with our, our lags. And if you get a chance to see our dolphins, they're all very acrobatic in every one of those behaviors. None of them were target trained. That was something new that we wanted to try. And that, I'm kind of proud of that accomplishment as well. Um, when so did that, you do this? When, when, when well, we started in 1989 <laughs> and uh, took a couple years. And then, of course, there was the concern that when we moved the animals and transported them here to Chicago, we housed them at Ken Norris's place in Santa Cruz, at University mm -hmm. of California at Santa Cruz. And uh, we did all of our training there while we were building this place. And then when we, uh, in 1991, right before we opened, we moved the animals here and then prayed that they would make the transfer <laughs> to, uh, to this huge pool where we were at. And they did, and they did that fine. And... Uh, I could probably go on, but those are some of the highlights of the kinds of things that I've trained that, or at least the ones to me were either the most challenging, the most exciting, or the ones that I'm most proud of. Good. Uh, do you uh, feel that animal research uh, and or in training methods apply to human psychology? Yes. Uh, without a doubt. I, I emphasize probably what I told you earlier, that the definition I use when I talk to people about training is training is teaching. It, we, whether it's teaching a child in school or a dog at home or a dolphin in the aquarium, the techniques are the same. You have to, you have to modify them to, to understand the animal you're working with, whether it be a child or a dog or whatever, and you don't try to teach a bird to do an underwater swimming routine, <laughs> and you don't try to teach a human being to flap its arms and fly. You have to know something about the animal's natural history, you have to know something about what the animal or the individual is capable of, but the techniques you apply to teaching are the same. And I don't think there's a difference. I think as a, as a supervisor, as a, as a person who has 16 employees under me who I have to, to get to work together, um, I try to use the same techniques in working with them as I would with the, uh, with the animals. I, I, don't use, I don't use a whistle and I don't use <laughs> fish, but I use the same positive reinforcement techniques and, uh, and to, to try to get them motivated and get them to enjoy their job and work well in this environment. In any of your work, have you found any failures of operant conditioning principles? That's hard to say. I don't believe so because I'm such, I'm such a believer that operant conditioning 
that operant pr principles are so important um, that uh, that usually if something fails, I, I can't say that I haven't had training fail, but I often think that the failing of of the training has been a product of one, the trainer. We have somehow not quite applied the principles correctly, or two, an animal situation or the situation we didn't read the situation properly. Uh, where operant training breaks down is when we try to think what the animal was thinking and we try to rationalize for that animal and go, well, I think the animal knew what he was supposed to do, <laughs> but because he's not feeling well today, he didn't do it, so I'm going to reinforce him anyway. And as soon as you do that, you're too busy trying to rationalize what the animal was thinking and you make mistakes. As I point out to young trainers, I, think, I say, it's the same thing with people. What happens, you come home 30 minutes late and you know that you were supposed to be home half an hour before and you forgot to call your, your spouse. And your spouse, you walk in, you see this scowl on your spouse's face. And before you know it, each one is reading into each other's expressions and mad at each other without even talking to one another. <laughs> and before you know it, you go to bed angry and you never even ask what the problem was. And it turns out that your spouse didn't even notice you were 30 minutes late. They were scowling because they got fired that day. But you never bothered to ask them. And so because you read each other's being angry, You've, you've exploded into some kind of an argument. My point being, if we can't figure out how to read each other, and we're people, we're the same species, and we can even talk to each other and ask what's wrong, how can we do that with the animal? I don't think there's anything wrong with being compassionate. We must be compassionate as trainers and try to understand what our animals are going through. But when it comes to making good, sound training decisions, you have to reinforce what you see happening and what is actually happening and not what you think the animal's thinking. And uh, I know I was going somewhere with this. I think I was, did I answer your question? <laughs> uh, yes, I okay. think so. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the question was about any failures of operations. Right. Oh, well, well my right. point was that I think the failures that, that you find in, in, in using operant techniques are usually with the operator, with those of us who are <laughs> Doing, doing the training, mm -hmm. doing the training, mm -hmm. not necessarily with the techniques. I think if you apply the techniques correctly, they work. With the exception of, let's say the subject that you're training is mentally handicapped, or but even then, they don't have to be no brain at all. I mean, if yeah. they if they mm -hmm. think, if they respond, if they feel, if you can find the proper reinforcement, th that that's another problem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, con <coughs> proper conditioning r requires being able to reinforce the subject properly. And if you just assume the animal likes fish, and maybe it's not a fish eater, well then, trying to you know trying to get my dog to be to do something well with a fish might not work. He doesn't like fish, so you have to find what the proper reinforcer is, and you have to apply the techniques correctly. And so usually the failing of operant training or operant conditioning training is in not applying the principles correctly. I think. Well, boy, you had some very interesting observations <laughs> there, too. Uh, that's very good. Um, now, you have a staff you supervise, and uh, you've trained them to, you've taught them to teach. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the programs you have set up for them, uh, after you have put them through their, you might say, preliminary courses and started them on training, do you notice any drift in the way that they handle the principles and train the animals? All the time. Um, I will say that I, I, I have to speak more from experience at other locations. We're a fairly new facility. Our oldest employee has only been with us for four years. Uh, I've only been here myself for a little over that because the, our, our department is new. But even in that amount of time, um, you go through a number of phases. And I think uh, uh, that's where, as a, as, a, as a supervisor, I have to continually watch the animal. And I think they drift just as an animal who's trained can drift. Once you've trained an animal and the animal sharp in its behavior, if you're not sharp as a trainer and continue to watch the animal, the animal's criteria may deteriorate and the animal may not do as well. Um, that's because you're, you're just sort of taking for granted that the animal knows what it's doing. If I, as a supervisor, take for granted that all of my staff knows what they're doing all the time, then they're, they begin to get sloppy and their ability to watch for problems uh, deteriorates. So one of my jobs is to continually watch for uh, drift in, in, in interest, in uh, making sure that people are still motivated, they still enjoy their job. Uh, I play games all the time. I, I'm a, I, I like to get the staff motivated by playing. About once a month we have a game night where everybody goes to somebody's apartment or house and we, 
we play the training game where we train each other or we we play a game I call trainer trivia. It's like Trivial Pursuit, but all the questions have to do with operant conditioning or have to do with conditioning techniques or terms. Uh, or we play uh, trainer Pictionary, which again is like Pictionary, but everything that they have to draw has to do with the job. And by doing that, it keeps them interested and without realizing it, they're, they're sharpening up on their skills, they're sharpening up on their terms. And I find that if we go three, four, five months without playing the games, you can see the staff begin to quit thinking as much about when they're bridging, when they're reinforcing, how they're reinforcing, the use of those reinforcers. Um, but by playing the games, they're having fun, but they're also, it's causing them after the game. You hear for the next two or three weeks, yeah, remember when we were training John to do such and such, and he didn't, it was because we didn't bridge properly, or because we were anticipating such and such, and, and, or we got superstitious behavior going, and, and it gets them talking, it gets them excited about their job, it gets them excited about the principles, and so, Yes, the answer to your question, I'm sorry, I can't answer any question with a yes or a no, but the answer is yes, there is drift. <laughs> okay. And I think you've described most of the, what you think are the causes of the drift yes. also. Um, well, um, uh, in your staff, uh, I assume you have a hand in hiring the people as well. Yes, in fact, uh, the, the, the initial staff, because of the, at the opening of this oceanarium, we had so many projects going in so many directions. I had, I had the sole, that was my, I did the whole hiring process. I didn't go through anybody else. Now that we're more settled in, I do the initial, uh, the initial uh, uh, interviews. I make my selection, and then I pass them up the line to make sure that other people up the line agree with our, our the choices. But yes, I'm very much a part of the hiring process. Uh, do you believe there are any particular problems uh, for women or minorities entering this field? Um, I don't find there's a problem for women entering the field. I know when I look back, uh, in the past it seemed like the majority of trainers were, were men. I find now that the majority of people applying are women. Uh, we happen to have a staff that is almost right down the middle. Um, if you were to take away the supervisors, uh, in an upper level position there are two men and one, and one woman in the position. Other than that, the, the staff is slightly heavy on the female side. Uh, Minorities, I also don't see a real problem with it. But what I do notice is there's several there's several minority groups that that uh, I think, for example, in the seven or eight hundred applications that we received from when we first started hiring till today, I believe in all of the interviews I've done, and I to fill the 13 positions we originally had, I interviewed 250 people. I know there was only one African American really? that even applied, that even yeah. that that I ever saw. So there weren't that many. So um, we have. Uh, uh, we happen to have one Asian American on our staff. In fact, she's our, our senior trainer of all, of all, she's our head trainer uh, under me. She's our lead, what we call our lead manager. But she was the only Asian American that mm -hmm. applied. No, that's not true. I take that back. I think there were two others uh, that applied after we'd already filled all the positions. Um, uh, so we, we don't seem to see a lot of minorities applying for, for, for the job. Um, also, I, I have seen a drift, though, in, in as far as the, the male, the male female thing. I do see more women in the field, and I'm also beginning to see a lot more women in um, uh, curatorial type positions or head trainer positions. It, it, it seemed for the longest time that the only place that you saw it was uh, saw Karen Pryor, then Ingrid uh, Kang mm -hmm. out at Sea Life Park, and, and almost at hardly any of the other mm -hmm. facilities did you ever see that. But now you have like. At the New York Aquarium, used to be Allison Seacat was their, their curator and head trainer. At the New England Aquarium, Kathy Krieger's their head trainer. At uh, the Brookfield Zoo, uh, there was um, uh, Marty Sevenick for a while, and now Tara Gifford is, is in charge of their training program. Uh, and you're, so you're seeing that more and more, and I, I don't think it's a, mm -hmm. I don't think, from my perspective, there's not that barrier. I think there used to be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you experienced any ethical objections about changing and controlling behavior? Um, yes. I, uh, certainly there are, um, we receive it from the protest groups all the time. I think we in the marine mammal field are, are particularly sensitive to the fact that there is a, a, a small but very vocal group of protesters out there who do not feel that zoos or aquariums should exist but they're particularly adamant about, about aquariums that work with cetaceans. And, uh, and one of the things that they seem to harp on is the concept of training. Uh, the fact that we are dominating these animals, the fact that in their opinion we are controlling them. Uh, 
I, I like to point out to them that, that it's, that it, that's why I like to use the word teaching. I like yes. to point out that that's what we're doing. When a calf is born in the wild, the mother dolphin trains it, teaches it how to avoid, avoid predators, how to find food, how to survive. And that's what we're doing in this environment. We are teaching it. Uh, and uh, I really believe that what we do serves a really vi vital function in, the, in, in enhancing the lives of these animals. And uh, we, we are no longer in the field, in this field, or at least in, in, in the facilities that I've worked with recently, are we there forcing an animal to participate. Uh, we try to make the sessions fun for them so that they want to participate. But certainly there are those who, who voice those objections. Um, I don't see the objections from people within our staff. Uh, but then we, that's why they're in this field, because they feel that it's a very important thing and a worthwhile field and something that's important to the animals. But certainly we've experienced it and heard it. Have you had any out and out protests from, I mean, vigorous or active protests from animal rights uh, activists? Very, very much so. Um, being a new facility, we were we, in, in a large city, we were high profile, high, mm -hmm. the target of <coughs> one, trying to keep us from ever building the facility. Once it was obvious that we were building it, they tried to block and filed lawsuits to keep us from collecting our animals. Once we collected our animals, they tried to prevent us from transporting them. Once we transported them, they tried to, to protest our opening day, our uh, um, every, every step of the way, whenever we have a major event, they're out there protesting. Mm -hmm. And we have, a, we have protests almost uh, quite a bit, of, almost every weekend in the summer, we have somebody out there. It hasn't affected the, the support from the Chicago community, and we still have uh, uh, large numbers of people who believe in what we do and who supported us, but there are the protests mm -hmm. and they're out there, and, and we've certainly been how have you handled them? By ignoring them or do you have to use legal action? To no, we haven't done any kind of legal action. Our approach has always been to, to try to meet with them face to face. Uh, I firmly believe that in most cases, when you talk to the protesters, some of their interests are the same as ours. They have an interest in educating the public. They have an interest in promoting conservation ethics. The only difference between us and them is that we're on different sides of a philosophical fence as to the best way to go about doing it. I very strongly believe that if we care about these animals in the wild, we need to educate the public about them. And one of the best ways to do that is to let people see them up close. They, on the other hand, believe that we should leave them alone, keep them in the wild, let people see them there. I have a couple of real concerns about that. And one of those is, that's what we've done for years, is we've left them alone and it's not helping. They're just, we're polluting the air, we're dumping in their oceans, we're cutting down the trees. And even if you don't, that a zoo or an aquarium is right, then you're going to continue to believe that. But we, on the other hand, who work here, who work with the animals, feel very strongly that it's an important, it serves a very important function. Uh, it, was there any event in your career, would you say, that dramatically changed its direction? Well, wow. I, I again harken back to working with the guide dogs for the, uh, for the blind. Uh, that changed the direction in me moving into this into an animal mm -hmm. care field. I think um, uh, perhaps another area was when I was offered the position of curator of marine mammals in Texas, which was uh, almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it was at that point, I had been in the field six years and didn't know where I was going to go. I, the facility I was working at was looking at some financial hard times, and I was thinking of a career change at the time. And had Marine World of Texas not offered me a curator position at the time, I didn't even know they were looking for a curator, I would have probably moved out of the field and not gotten back into it. It was getting that job that, that really, that's when I got really active in IMATA. That's when I really immersed myself into this field. And, and mm -hmm. it's at that point that I would truly say that I became a true professional. At, but prior to that, certainly I was m making a living at it. But it was sort of still like a passing kind of, well, it's a job that I have. I really enjoy it, but I, I didn't know where I was going. Uh, and then four years ago, four and a half years ago, moving to Shed Aquarium, even focused it more. I really feel like this has uh, been a program that I have helped put together from the ground, and uh, I'm very proud of what we've put together here. Very satisfying. Yeah, it is. Um, what do you consider to be your most significant uh, work 
proudest, is the accomplishment that you're proudest? Of? I think the, 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 this current one, uh, the, the building of this staff and the training of this group of animals. Uh, when I came to the Shedd Aquarium, we had no animals and we had no staff. And uh, I have been a, a, a big part of putting this program together and I'm very proud of what we've accomplished. I, I, I think we have a long way to go. We're a young organization with a, uh, we'd like to see breeding programs started. We'd like to see a lot of things happen. Um, so it's hard to say we're finished with it yet, but I'm proud of how far we've come so far. Ah, <clears throat> if you had your professional life to do over again, is there anything you'd do differently? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, not that I could think of. I, 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 I'm such a believer in, in I'm real happy where I am today, and I might, my answer might be different if I was not happy here, because, because I'm happy with where I am today. There's certainly been times in my past that I've not been happy, but I certainly believe that it was those experiences that led me to where I am today. And so because of that, I'd be afraid to say, well, I wish this had this one year hadn't been there. But if it hadn't, I might not be where I am today. And so I'm, I'm, I'm very aware of that. And so I have to say, no, I, I certainly can think of some really sad times. I can think of some tragic events or, uh, or, or experiences that were not pleasant. But um, uh, for the most part, I, I really feel like I am in a field that I, one that I enjoy, I'm in a field that I think makes a difference and it's so seldom that, that people can do a work, do a, be in a job that they want to enjoy, but they are to the ver at the very least these days you need a minimum of a bachelor's degree to get an entry level position. Um, and so I encourage young people to go to school, at the very least get a bachelor's degree in a related field, a related field being biology, marine biology, psychology, zoology, education, experience as possible. I always like to to them that they get a job working at a veterinary clinic, uh, get a job at a stable, a kennel, uh, on a ranch, a farm, uh, at a rehab center, volunteer at a zoo or an aquarium. All of those kinds of experiences I think are valuable because they're experiences that you can put on a resume there are experiences in which you're working at a facility where you're having to care for animals on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, as a person who looks at resumes, who looks at prospective employees, the degree is important because it's something the aquarium wants. Experience is critical as well. I encourage people to do that. And I encourage people to get as much, a wider breadth of experience as possible, not to just put blinders on and assume, well, all I want to work with is marine mammals, so I don't want to touch any other animals <coughs> at all. Almost every single person I know who's ever worked with marine mammals has had exposure to other kinds of animals as well and has learned a lot from them. And there's so much you can learn from training a bird that you'll never learn from working with a dog or a dolphin or a whale. And there's so much you can learn from working with an otter that you won't learn or a lion or an ape. And, uh, and I encourage people to get those kinds of experiences because basic care, husbandry, food preparation, cleaning is the same. And if you're interested in training, whether you're training your horse to pr participate in an equestrian event, or you're trying to do well in a dog show, or just an obedience class, that kind of training is still very, very valuable and very pertinent to this field. And I also encourage them to try to become participants in some of the organizations, whether it be the International Marine Animal Trainers Association, or the American Association of Zoological Parks and Aquariums, or the American Association of Zookeepers. I point out that if they're really interested in marine mammals, there's also the Society for Marine Mammalogy. I try to point them in a lot of those kinds of directions. And we have a, a, a number of pieces of literature that we try to direct them toward and, and letters that we send them to, to, to get them interested. And, uh, and I encourage them to ask questions and meet people like myself in, 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 in my role as past president and as uh, officer and board member of the International Marine Animal Trainers Association. I've been very active with them and done a lot toward moving the, the organization in the direction it's gone in the last couple of years. And I'd, I'd like to think that I've been a big part of that as well. It's kind of kind of hard, I think, at, at, my, at my age to, 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 to presume that I've had much of an impact at all, but I certainly hope I've had some impact. What groups of people would you like to influence? Uh, well, I'd love to be able to influence the protesters who don't think that what we're doing <laughs> is right, uh, but maybe that's just dreaming. Realistically speaking, I'd love to be able to influence uh, our profession. 
I, I, at the last several conferences, I've done a number of papers. At the last paper that we did at the, uh, at the uh, conference in, uh, in the Bahamas, we did a, con a paper on otter training. And I was really, really speaking hard. I really would like to see the industry as a whole, and I include the zoos, not just the aquariums, realize that training is an, is an important, critical part of good animal care. And I think it's, a, it's important for all animals, not just the dolphin that's going to be in a dolphin show or the elephant because it's a big and unmanageable animal that you have to train it or you can't manage it. I would love to see zoos be able to put the kind of staff on and behavioral programs and have people in charge of behavioral management so that they can work with some of the stereotypic behavior that you see in bears or that you see in, in, in some of the animals that just don't get, aren't given the behavioral enrichment and the kind of, of things that they perhaps need to have more fulfilling lives. I think the kinds of things that we are capable of doing, those of us that work with offered conditioning and work with behavior, can do a lot to really influence the field that I, 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 I shudder when I hear people who train say, well, we train dolphins, of course, and we train our sea lions for the show, but we don't train the rest of our animals. We want them to be natural. And I, 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 I get angry at that because I, I, I think they're being hypocritical. It seems to me that if, if they believe that training is good for the dolphin and the killer whale and the, and the California sea lion, then why isn't it good for the other animals? And I think those of us that really believe in training know that it's a benefit to these animals and all animals should be trained. And I will continue to fight for that. And I, I, I was very fortunate, and I know I'm fortunate, that I was able to put together a program in a facility that never had a history with marine mammals before. So I was able to get a big enough staff where we can approach training our otters and seals and penguins and all of those animals. I know some facilities don't have the funding for it, and because they don't have a history of having trained those animals, some of the trainers believe that that's important, but management doesn't. So it's going to be a constant struggle, but I'm going to continue to push for that by writing papers and doing presentations at conferences that show people what can be done, how much in the long run, how much effort can be saved, how much stress can be removed from the animals' lives by teaching them to participate and cooperate in their care. Sure. So that's the kind of influence I'd like to make. And I, I won't be able to do it alone, but I'd certainly like to be a part of that. You've already answered part of this question about using uh, operating conditioning methods mm -hmm. with your staff mm -hmm. and your co-workers. Um, what about your family and friends? Have you uh, on this? That's a good question. <laughs> I, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, my daughter is four and a half years old, and she was born in 1988. And it was very interesting because I, I when she was born, um, we had this problem where, she, you know, like, like most babies, she would cry, cry, and cry throughout the night. And I was determined not to be one of these parents who let my training background fly out the window and forget that what we've done with other, uh, <laughs> with, 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 with the animals can apply to working with people. And I worked with my wife, and, and we worked very hard at, at, at approximating our daughter's crying to a shorter and shorter period of time. Because as a new parent, you get very concerned that maybe, yes, maybe, maybe something's, something's really wrong. wrong. And so, of course, at the beginning, you would make sure until you really learned. And I, I found that if I could, could uh, uh, just let, the, let, let our daughter cry for a little bit longer, uh, don't go and, and check in on her too soon, and, and slowly not pay the attention to her crying unless I was certain that there was a problem, sure enough, it would quit and she'd sleep through the night. And we used those kinds of approximation techniques, and it was something that I would never have thought to do or never known to do if I hadn't uh, used those techniques in working with, uh, with animals. Um, and I try to use it in everyday life. I try to use it in dealings with people anywhere that I am. Uh, but sometimes you let your guard down. You're not <laughs> thinking that way. And of course, it doesn't always work. But, but I, I think it, it's certainly effective. And I think, uh, again, I go back to Karen Pryor's book. I think she, she did a very good job of, of giving certain scenarios, whether it be the dog barking outside all night or the, the roommate or spouse that leaves their clothes on the floor and how you correct those problems. I think yeah, there are ways of eliminating problem behavior. There's our ways of, of, sh of rewarding good behavior. And uh, uh, I've always tried to apply it. I won't say that I've always done it successfully, but I, I certainly have, have seen that it's important and it's effective, and I try to apply it on, in everyday life when I can. <laughs> <laughs> but have you ever tried to modify your own behavior with it? Um, you know, I have only on a couple occasions, and I've always, always fallen short of being able to accomplish it. It's like, I'll decide that I want to accomplish a certain certain amount of certain task, or I'm going to set these kinds of goals, and I'm going to reward myself for 
if I, when I get this accomplished, I'm going to take a break and reward myself this way or that way. And it will be very effective for a week. But inevitably, my schedule gets so harried, and because other people are affecting my schedule or causing me to, then I don't get accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, and then it wasn't my fault. But then, and you get yourself all worked up, and you find out, you say, well, forget it. And, and I find myself not working as hard to do it on myself. I probably two or three times in the past I can think of when I've said I'm going to try it, and I didn't succeed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I certainly failed miserably there in trying to accomplish certain goals <laughs> using those techniques on myself. And I, th I think it's it. probably because I'm so conscious that I'm doing it that I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I haven't given. It's like I don't give. I don't give enough thought to it when I'm working. It's like I, I won't worry about it with myself. I'm going to deal with these problems first. Mm -hmm. and, uh, do you think uh, operant conditioning techniques have been successful in solving human problems? I think they can be, and I think I've probably seen them be successful, but I don't think people use them as much as they should or as often as they could to solve human problems. Uh, but I think they can be successful, yes. Can you suggest some ways in what you've seen of human behavior gone the, in which uh, it could be useful where you think it's not now being used? Oh, well, I, I can see it just in basic employee-employer relationships in many, many, many job situations where I think if, if supervisors and employers were better trained in, in using operant conditioning techniques, that they would get much more productivity from their staff and have a happier staff to boot. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, in, uh, and to me, that's, I guess that's where I see it because that's where I use it the most and, and I see when I, I, even within our own facility, not every department, has that kind of background and, and, and they don't necessarily use those techniques and you see, you see a very disgruntled and unhappy staff and the employer is unhappy and the employee is unhappy and uh, right there at the beginning that would be one way that I see that it could be done. I also think that I, I haven't, there's a number of other areas in, in society where I think it could be helpful but because I'm maybe perhaps more ignorant of, of what goes on there I, I don't want to speak out of turn but I certainly feel like uh, in um, rehabilitation efforts with uh, with uh, felons and criminals, I think our jail system, I think, is I, I don't know of a better system. So I'm, I'm and because I don't really feel like I'm interested enough to spend a lot of time studying it, I'm not sure what methods I could suggest to correct it. Um, but it, it seems to me that in all in all, all we are trying to do is punish and. Uh, and, and the rehabilitation efforts, there's not enough people to try to help rehabilitate criminals that they want to rehabilitate to really positively enforce behavior properly and, uh, and get people back into society again. And I think there, it seems like there could be a way of doing that, but I, I, I may be perhaps being way too, too idealistic and too hopeful that that could work. And, and I don't want to, to, to turn my career around and go that direction. <laughs> and so I haven't really given it that much thought. And, uh, I just know that if, if more people were versed in, in using operant conditioning techniques and skills properly, I think we'd have a happier place to live in in the whole world overall. I really believe that. And, and I think it feeds on itself because I think when, when you use your, your, these techniques properly, you have people around you that are happier. That makes you happier and that makes life happier and everybody's happier. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, are you optimistic about the future of the field? I am. I do think that that some of the reason we have the kind of protest that we have is because we have made mistakes in our past as in, as in any field. And I also believe that there are still those, uh, those facilities or institutions who don't keep their facilities clean and nice. And I believe there's some in other parts of the world that don't have the kinds of regulations that we have in the United States that, that still need to be really looked at. And we have been very slow within our field to police ourselves. We've been very hesitant to want to go to one of our colleagues and say, hey, I'm not happy with what you're doing. Don't you think you ought to change that? And uh, uh, we've just gotten to a point in our in our this field where we are able to work together a little bit better, but there's still tension there between facilities. But I, I'm optimistic that the bigger and better facilities are going to be around. I do believe we're going to be fighting an uphill battle, and I think we'll reach a plateau. I think what'll happen is We'll fight this uphill battle, and at some point, we'll achieve an area where many of the protest groups will be comfortable that they've accomplished something, and we'll be working.
be stricter guidelines, and then for a while everything will be fine, and then for four or five years, and then something will hit that will cause there to be a big struggle again, and it will be a fight again, and, and I think slowly but surely there are going to be fewer and fewer facilities, and I think, uh, but I don't believe that it's a losing battle, and I don't believe that uh, it's a lost cause. I just think that we have had some skeletons in our closet, we've had some bad, uh, some bad facilities, some bad zoos, some bad management in some facilities that have caused the entire animal uh, community to get a bad name, and it's, it's just not the case. It's not, it's not true that those things exist everywhere, and uh, I think we're in the process of trying to clean up our act, and I, I, I think there's a future. I don't mm -hmm. think it's lost. On a scale from one to four, how optimistic would you say you are? <laughs> Which is the most optimistic? The, uh, the high would be four. Four. Um, I tend to be a very optimistic person, so I would say three. I would say, uh, and that's, uh, I'm sort of censoring myself a little. I'd like <laughs> to say four, but I don't think I'm necessarily quite that optimistic. <laughs> okay. Uh, most people seem not to have a very clear idea of what uh, science is all about. Uh, could you uh, uh, give us your definition of science? And just well, science in general, not not just wow. bi biological, marine animal science. Yeah. That's the first question you've shot at me that just throws me. What is my definition of science? <laughs> uh, I guess my definition of science is uh, uh, probably very vague, but it's probably the discovery of and learning about things, period. Okay. What about technology? How would you distinguish that from science? Uh, technology is not, in my opinion, is not necessarily science. I think technology springs from science. I think technology is, I guess in my opinion, I think of technology as this camera in front of me. I think of technology as uh, uh, the application of perhaps certain scientific principles or things that we've learned from science uh, being put to use in any number of ways. And it may be put to use in an, in an entertainment fashion, or it may be put to use in a medical format. It may be put to use in, in a, as a tool that helps us live our lives more comfortably or speed our lives up. Uh, technology is, I think of it as, as, as hard, concrete equipment, uh, things that you can utilize. And I realize that's probably not an accurate definition, but that's what I think of when I think of mm -hmm. technology. I think of uh, the application of scientific principles toward the building of or the construction of useful tools and materials. Okay. Uh, what's been the impact of science on your own life? Um, since I consider the field that I'm in to be a scientific endeavor, I think we are in a, uh, we are on on a learning, a road to learning, a road to discovery. We are here to learn about these animals, to apply what we've learned uh, to the animals in the wild. Uh, I think science is is all around me, and it's all it's mm -hmm. it's a part of what we do every day, uh, and it's an important part of of my life, just because that's the field that I'm in. I'm in a scientific career, in a sense. Um, so I, I guess. That's my answer, I think. All right. <laughs> what about the impact of science on the world as a whole? Oh, I think the world is certainly a, a different place because of science. I think we, we uh, because of our quest for knowledge, because of our desire to learn more and discover new things, uh, it's why we continually evolve and progress. Uh, uh, without that, we wouldn't be where we are today. We'd probably be, I don't know, we'd be in the dark ages somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think the average person in the street's concept of science is? I think if you were just asked the general uh, general public what is science, they they probably say, well, it's like biology and chemistry and uh, you know those subjects we took in school. Um, I don't know. I, I I think some many people would probably grapple for an answer just like I did, and I'm not sure what they would say. I'm not sure I have a good concept of that. <laughs> I've never I've never thought about it in terms of what is. Science. I, I've always looked at it more narrowly, and I, I think there's no doubt that what I'm in is part of science, but what in the broader term what science is, is is a good question, and I probably something I'll debate with myself now for the next year until I come up with an answer. What do you think we could do about, uh, uh, you might say, educating the general public more in what science is and what, you know, what it does and what it's about? Well, I think certainly, um, um, I think kids sometimes get turned off 
in school by science just because of, uh, of perhaps the way it's taught. I certainly think that uh, there are a lot of ways of making science and all the things that it, that, that it involves more palatable. And uh, uh, when they realize what science is, um, of course, I'm talking, I'm not sure I know what science is now that you asked me, but I think uh, um, it's just a matter of uh, uh, teaching the public and letting the public, getting, getting the public to realize how enjoyable learning can be and, and, and uh, the joy of discovery. And, and I think a lot of people do enjoy science and do find that science is important. They just don't know, think of it in those terms. You could probably find things in their lives, and things that they do that are scientific in nature, but they've just never considered that before. And once they, we were to point that out to them, they may go, oh, well, yeah, now that you put it that way. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks so much for sharing your experiences oh, and your time thank you. with us. We appreciate it very much. Oh, my pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me. Thanks.